Riley said, I got a vowel at the end of my name, too. It's a silent E. Treasurer Riley That's Moore right. is here as well. Good morning, Riley. <laughs> Good morning, sir. How Good are you doing? Good morning. Doing well. Thanks for having me. Good to have you at St. Joe's yesterday. I was. Man, what were you there for? So we were there talking about the Hope Scholarship. Um, I think as some people had been following that, we had an injunction placed on Hope Scholarship for, well, it was about a half a year. We went through different court battles and that and it went up to the state supreme court where we were ultimately victorious and the uh, program was ruled constitutional by the state supreme court and injunction lifted so we've really been three months back into it we weren't able to disperse funds um, initially because the injunction was placed about a week right before we were going to disperse funds. And so now we've been going through and back paying individuals that went ahead and continued on their um, educational choice, whether that was uh, homeschool or a private school, but they went out on their own dime. So then we've gone back and made those individuals whole. So we met with about... I'd say 50 parents at St. Joseph's in Martinsburg yesterday answered a lot of questions. Uh, there's a lot of questions as it relates to the portal and how it works. It's all digital. It's all online. we got a digital wallet where the money goes in. And then the education service provider, they have to sign up as well. So you can choose their tuition or their books or uniforms and this and that. So just walking through that whole process, I will tell you, St. Joseph's has seen particularly uh, in kindergarten, just a uh, a big upshoot in uh, applications and people wanting to go. St. Joseph's is actually expanding uh quite a bit uh there a lot of a lot of new enrollees to the school there so that was good to see very nice where were you when my kids were at st joe's <laughs> <laughs> is this retroactive could i, could I make a claim to get my money right. <laughs> he, he was welding stuff together back yeah, then. yeah 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 it takes you back too far but right. uh, I'm, I'm sure i'm very familiar with st joe's i was actually on their school board for a while and my all three of my girls graduated from there and uh that will be a big shot in the arm for that school. Oh, yes. Just alone. Uh, you know, there's always been a rumor about St. Joe's starting a high school. Yes. I wonder if this will be another impetus for doing that. Uh, I will tell you, as a Catholic, we, we have to get a Catholic high school in the Eastern Panhandle. There's not one Catholic high school. Well, you got to go to Goretti. That's the you got to go to Goretti. Yeah. And Goretti is advertising Hope Scholarship, by the way. And we do have students in West Virginia, so the West Virginia residents, that can use this out of state. And that was put in place uh, in large part due to the delegation here in the Eastern Panhandle saying, look, we don't have as many options as everybody else has throughout the state. So, I mean, Charleston has Catholic High School, Clarksburg Catholic High School, everybody, uh, Beckley and so on and so forth. There is no Catholic high school here. So you're able to use the Hope Scholarship dollars uh, to go to Goretti, as long as you're a West Virginia resident. Riley, would you remind us how much money we're talking about for a student? Yes, so it's determined on uh, enrollment and uh, the student funding formula, but generally it's around $4,300. Now that can fluctuate depending on enrollment, about a couple hundred dollars. So you could get up to 4,500, maybe 4,600, maybe go down to 4200 something like that but it's generally around that that number there's a part of that i don't understand and and maybe you could help me on this one because uh, i know the republicans in the house right now and and the senate are talking about the future bill of the increased participation in the hope scholarship Mm -hmm. but i thought that money was what was already coming out of the overall amount of money that follows a student in a public school anyway and I thought the selling point on this was, well, we're, that big chunk of money that follows every student to the public schools, we're just carving like a third of that out and letting them take it to the private school if that's where they go. And the public schools still keeping two thirds of the money. So how is it more expensive to the state if more students take advantage of the Hope Scholarship since that money was already there anyway? Yeah, kind of the dollars follow the student, right, uh, is the way that they had talked about it. Functionally, what has to happen is that there does have to be an appropriation because as you don't have that student and that requirement uh, to educate that child so that per pupil student funding formula of the $4,300 is not part of the calculus 
And so you do have to have an appropriation that goes from the Department of Education into the HOPE Scholarship Fund. I will tell you one of the problems, the way this program uh, was set up, and this is something they're looking at right now, the HOPE Scholarship Funds are based on last year's enrollment. But every year we're seeing an increase in HOPE Scholarship students. So let's say 3,000 took it last year. I got 5,000 this is next year, but yeah. it's based on last year. The numbers don't add up. And so the governor has talked about, and that was in his state of the state, uh, appropriating $15 million just to help smooth it out. Now, when you get to 2026, uh, it, it will be a substantial cost. I think a cost that is certainly well worth it uh, as it relates to educational choice and freedom in the state of West Virginia. But we're probably looking at a price tag about $130 million uh, when it, in 2026 when it opens up to everybody. And that's taking a lot of assumptions um, into that calculus that, say, half the private school students decide to use that and homeschool population. And this is one of the points that uh, Senator Tarr was making yesterday, uh, talking about the 50% tax reduction. And uh, he was uh, made several points that uh, several areas that we have an obligation uh, they'll have to pay, and Hope Scholarship was one. So. Yes, it, it is. And, I mean, in the out years, I mean, that's the estimate, $130 million a mm -hmm. year. Now, to me, I certainly think that is worth it. It's not a question of whether we have the resources. It's a question of allocation and will. That's really all that is the end of the day. We have a sizable surplus. We're on track for probably another $1.5 billion surplus. So it's really just a question of, is this what you want to do with that money? And there is legislation floating around out there today uh, to repeal that 45-day requirement uh, to be in public schools and just open it up wide open early and just take the band-aid off and let's get going Corey, thank you for being here first off and yeah. I'm, I'm gonna um read one of our uh questions from the facebook feed here sure um so jeff haddix asked and I, you may have already answered this so just just reaffirm it if so yeah um but he says ask mr moore um if all homeschoolers and private schools have received their hope scholarship money and i, I know that you had spoken briefly to the back pay and things of that sort but can you can you answer it in return in regards sure. to homeschoolers and <clears throat> private schools so what they had to do each individual had to apply uh with my office and they can do that online to be reimbursed not everybody who was approved for hope scholarship has applied for a reimbursement because many of them decided just to go back to public school but uh, of the 3,000 students that were approved for HOPE Scholarship, uh, we have, we're in the process now, but we'll end up paying out close to 2,000 of them. I think that's fair, and I wanted to just get sure. a viewer's comment on. Joe. Riley, I know one of the bills that the treasurer's uh, offices have uh, in front of the legislature right now has to do with ESG, which mm -hmm. is short for environmental, social, and governance issues. Talk a little bit about your bill and what you hope to accomplish with it. Sure. Uh, what we have going on right now, the uh, piece of legislation that I requested and put forward is a bill to protect our Second Amendment rights here in the state of West Virginia as it relates to credit card companies and banks tracking the purchase of guns and ammunition. So what has happened, credit card companies were pushed to institute a new merchant category code, so the new MCC. Previously, any purchase of guns and ammunition was uh, coded as sporting goods. That's it, that's the way it's been forever. Senator Elizabeth Warren, 28 other maniacs up there in Capitol Hill, push Amalgamated Bank in New York and others to adopt this new merchant category code and now the International Organization on Standardization, hard to believe that's a real thing, uh, has adopted this code and now this is the practice out here in the financial sector is that they will have specific codes to track guns and ammunition. This bill is going to prohibit them from doing that here in the state of West Virginia. What this is is creating a national backdoor gun registry 
which obviously they've tried to do that through the ballot box. and But this is the point of the whole ESG movement. It goes around the political process. No one got to vote on this, but it's going to affect your life nonetheless. So here in the state of West Virginia, this bill just passed 95 to 0 in the House, headed over to the Senate. If it passes, uh, it will create a cause of action for anyone whose data has been shared as it relates to gun and ammunition purchases outside of a subpoena or warrant, obviously. If it's been shared uh, without the uh, consent of an individual, uh, they can sue. And so that uh, cause of action for that would uh, include, I think it's $10,000 and liquidated damages, then uh, another cause of action that's created if you're a merchant and your uh, processor uh, at the terminal, you can't process your credit card transactions because you're a gun store, for instance. If that's cut off, uh, you can sue as well. And uh, if you're an individual, your credit card won't work, you can sue as well. Any financial institution that has violated this act will be prohibited from bidding on state contracts moving forward. How many states do you have with you on this, right? So we're the first one out of the gate on this. Uh, Florida is looking to replicate our bill. Uh, there's a few others that are floating around out there, but I think we're going to be, again, uh, the first state in this country to uh, put forward a solution on one of these ESG problems. Raleigh, I, I get confused between the state's rights and the national rights. So I understand there's an ESG national bill and the West Virginia is going to be a carve out, an exception to certain provisions of the national bill? How does that work? No, no, no. Um, so this is a national uh, code that's been put in place by an international organization uh, as it relates to uh, credit card transactions and that merchant category code. So tomorrow, if they woke up and said, we don't want to do this anymore, they don't have to do this. Uh, in terms of having that code on guns and ammunition. This bill is protecting our data from being used against us here just in the state of West Virginia. So it's, it is not running counter to something that's passed the U.S. Uh, Congress? No, okay. no, it is not something that's passed the U.S. Congress. And that's the point, is that something like this would not pass the U.S. Congress. It wouldn't have the ability to do that. That's why they're doing this through our financial uh, services sector because they can't achieve this at the ballot box. When you uh, purchase a firearm and you go through the FBI background check, do they keep your record as having purchased a firearm on a hard drive somewhere or in the cloud that they always have access to it to know that uh, Riley Moore purchased three firearms in December of 2018? Uh, we approved them on a background check for two in December of 21. Is, is that, does it work that way at the FBI level, do you know? Uh, you know, I, I'd assume that it would, but I don't know that for sure. So I don't want to say that with any certainty. But I do know this, that previously any purchase of guns and ammunition was just classified as sporting goods. Now, look, they categorize a multiple, uh, multiple uh items that are bought but it's very broad groceries gasoline this and that and uh for record keeping purposes but they're taking that record keeping requirement and now weaponizing it against people and it's going to have a chilling effect at the end of the day on the second amendment and that's what we're worried about and that's what we're trying to protect against here in west virginia joe well I, i'm just curious when you say they were weaponizing it what was their intent to do with the information because I, I understood uh, when when uh, and I'm not a big fan of hers but when Senator Warren spoke to this of course the idea was perhaps they could interdict uh, somebody who was amassing tremendous quantities of ammunition with the intent of you know being a mass shooter or doing something harm on, on a mass scale uh, I don't I, I don't recall there being an issue about how they were going to weaponize it to somehow deprive people of the right to have that well, ammunition or gun. Well, you're a lawyer. I mean, I think this could have a chilling effect, though, perhaps on people's purchases of guns and ammunition if they'd like in having those transactions uh, uh, tracked by a credit card company or a bank. But secondarily, to her point, you read the letter they want banks and credit card companies to start to flag what they deem as suspicious activity which is certainly subjective to have some financial institution in the middle of this this is why the credit card companies really don't want to do this because they don't want the liability 
involved in this where let's say somebody uh, did committed some heinous crime with some gun that they purchased with a Visa uh, credit card. Is there now liability on Visa for not stopping that because of this new uh, merchant category code that they've put in place? I don't know the answer to that, but that's the job of government, right, is to figure out where there might be suspicious activity as it relates to uh, guns and ammunition purchases. That's not the job of Visa. That's not the job of a bank. And so that's that's part of the issue here. And when you look at her letter, it's very clear uh, how she wants this to be used. She wants credit card companies and banks to start to monitor, track, and flag what they deem as suspicious activity. Let me ask you a question from Damon Wright, who works for the ATF and is a member of the Berkeley County Board of Education. As a private company, are they not allowed to code how they see fit? So if the credit card company on their own wanted to code guns, ammo, give them different codes or separate coding from sporting goods, would they as a private company have the right to do that? So they have the ability to code that. They, in, If this bill passes, they do not have the ability to just share that data with anybody they want, uh, on, only subject to a warrant or a subpoena. So this is protecting the data. I can't tell Visa and MasterCard you can't code your data this way or that way because you run into an interstate commerce clause issue, right? They have the ability to code it. What we're trying to do is protect it as it relates to how it's being shared and how it's being used. So it's not the coding that's the issue, it's the sharing. Well, the coding is the issue. I'm not in Congress yet, so I don't have the ability to uh, do anything beyond that scope due to the kind of interstate commerce issues uh, as it relates to the way that they're going to uh, track their purchases of guns and ammunition. In regards to coding, if I go to the, a fireworks shop and buy M80s, is it coded? That Do you have any idea? I mean, I'm, I'm getting into sure. the weeds here. But, I'm not sure how that one's coded. I don't know. Right? I'm just curious about my teen years here, Joe, and see what kind of record I have in the FBI files. Uh, oh, if you only knew. <laughs> 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 Call your own. As, um, you know, I, I personally... Um, I understand, you know, why um, this measure is getting um, at least bipartisan support in the, the House. Um, I truly do, because we're in a, a ever evolving world where it seems as though every major tech company or any um, other large conglomerate of the sort is trying to pry as much personal data as they can from the individual. Um, so I do believe that this is going to provide protection to the individual in terms of their, their privacy in terms of what they have purchased. But I will also say on the other hand, I am not, I'm not quite sure of, other than, you know, I, I understood what you said outside, you know, what could come from, you know, the data being shared with the incorrect people. But I do not necessarily believe that it is as big of a problem as it's being stated. Um, I believe that, you know, the intent by Senator Warren, who I will say I am also not the biggest fan of, um, I believe it was to try and stop at least or apprehend uh, and before, you know, try and slow down these large mass shootings we are seeing, um, you know, so I see on that standpoint where it could actually be a benefit. And I see, and I see that those types of things as benefits to people like myself who are, um, you know, responsible gun owners. Um, if we can do anything to stop the the crazy and the mass shootings and if that comes through a code that shows that Jim Bob down the street bought however much ammunition and however many weapons and I I just don't I just don't see I see it more of as a boogeyman especially in the state of West Virginia to think that our government would then get this data from these companies somehow and use well, it against our citizens and, and that's the problem that this is not government we're talking about a credit card company or a bank or a gateway that's involved in that um, in that transaction, right? That's the job of government. And it also opens up a slippery slope. Let's say tomorrow, uh, now Republicans are in charge and they say, you know what? We need a new merchant category code to track uh, anything that has to do with abortion, reproductive issues, birth control, things like that. Why don't we start tracking that? We can start tracking all of that, and since abortion is now illegal in the state of West Virginia, we can see who is involved in what. Is that where we want to go? Do we want to head down the road on that? I mean, it's a very slippery slope when you start weaponizing these financial institutions for your own political purposes. 
Let me let me uh, go away from financial institutions just a second. Uh, the data that is collected, is there an appropriate distribution list, for example, at the police department or the law enforcement? Mm -hmm. Would you be supportive of that information being collected for those institutions? Well, that's why we have a carve-out for subpoena or warrant. Okay. So they, can, they do have the ability to have access to that information. Um, and secondarily, we do know that individuals that I've spoken to that own uh, gun stores and uh, are merchants have had issues with certain processors uh, uh, using them to be able to fulfill transactions in their store because they're not amenable or favorable towards the Second Amendment. So this is the, that's trying to protect this. What is lawful commerce? I mean, at the end of the day, this is lawful commerce, and this is going to have a chilling effect on something that is completely legal. So I'm hearing you say there are no good, solid reasons to collect this data. Well, I mean, you have not I, guess, any... I guess if you're Elizabeth Warren, there no, is. No, no, is no. That... I, I'm trying to take politics out of it. Right. Uh, you, as an individual, you do not see a good, solid reason. Not, no, I do not. Not for law in enforcement or for anybody. No. Well, and if law enforcement wants to subpoena that information or they have a warrant, then they can get to that information if they need to. Will says the ATF can find the owner of a gun by tracing the serial number of the gun. That database is supposedly not searchable by owner. And then Matt McKinney on our Facebook feed said FFL holders keep a gun log of firearms in and out of their shop. When you, when you do the NICS background check, the retailer lets FBI know the type of gun, i.e. long gun, pistol, etc. While the FBI isn't specifically told the type of firearm, the ATF can audit an FFL's gun log anytime. So that information is available to law enforcement okay. in those means. Uh, just to clarify a couple yeah. of questions we had earlier. Riley, 9 o'clock. I know you've got places to go. Final word is yours. You know, um, Everybody, I'm going to keep uh, getting around the second congressional district. I think uh, some of the listening audience is aware, but I am running for Congress uh, to replace Alex Mooney, who is now running for the United States Senate. You can find more information on more for WV.com. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And uh, stay pretty busy, and I try to keep it entertaining. And uh, hopefully I got a walk-off song here. Did you did you get did you get Lala Mooney's endorsement by the way? I, I did. Uh, I got the Lala Mooney endorsement. You told me I get walk off song. I didn't even get what my walk on song. What do you want? You told me it was back in black. Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot. <laughs> you never trust a guy this who's guy. sleep deprived. Yeah. <laughs> never never ever trust a guy who's sleep deprived. Yeah. All right, here you go, bud. There we go. <laughs> you can go to more for WV.com to learn more. Have a good day, man. Hey, y'all have a good one. Thank Thanks you. For Thanks, by. Riley. Thanks, Riley. That is our skateboarding treasurer, Riley Moore.